Good afternoon, this is Quintus Curtius. Welcome back to the podcast. And in this podcast, we'll be talking about surrealism, or more specifically, surrealist painting. And you may be wondering, why why is he talking about this? Well, I got the idea to do this from one of my followers on Twitter asked about it. He said something like, hey, do you uh, think you could do a podcast on surrealism or surrealist painting? I'd like to hear it. And I thought at first, eh, it's pretty easy to find out information about surrealism to anybody who really is interested. But I thought, well, you know, maybe true, but sometimes people want to hear it from you. They want to hear what you think about it. They want to hear your ideas. They want to hear you deliver it. They want to hear your thoughts. So I said, okay. I thought it was a good idea. So that's why that's why I'm doing this uh, this surrealist podcast here right now. So let me dive right in and, and just start to talk about surrealist painting. And I think the first thing that I would want to say about surrealist painting, and again, this podcast is not going to be a comprehensive history of every aspect of surrealism because that is a vast, vast subject. There are literally literally hundreds of surrealist painters. It's also an artistic movement that encompassed uh, the literary genre, uh, film, design, uh, sculpture. So there's no way to treat the whole thing. All I'm going to really do here in this podcast is talk about my opinions of surrealism and what it means to me and what painters I think are worth checking out for someone who's interested in the subject. That's all. So I don't make any promises here to have any exhaustive studies done. This is just me giving my impressions. So I want to make that clear right from the beginning. But in any case, uh, surrealism, as I said, is a uh, surrealist painting is part of a whole movement. It was part of a whole movement that, that grew out of Dadaism. Surreal the surrealist movement really grew out of the, the Dada movement, Dadaist movement, which was an artistic movement that sort of coalesced in Switzerland, I think it was Zurich, uh, around 1916. And it basically was an anti-war absurdist movement. It, it, the, the idea was it was a form of protest, and it meant it intended to accentuate the ridiculous, the absurd the insanity of life and of the war that was raging all around them at that time. And to do this in an artistic format. And by doing so, they hoped to awaken people's senses to the horrors and to the absurdity of modern life in many ways. So in many ways, it was very negative in the sense that it was, it, it, it sought to, it sought to tarnish people's vision with negativity in such a way that it would awaken them to the horrors of what were what were happening around them all right so it it served its purpose and i think it's certainly a school of art that's that's certainly worth checking out nothing wrong with it but surrealism basically grew out of dadaism in the post war years the post world war 1 years but instead of being very negative and deconstructionist and, and, and um, in many ways dark, surrealism really sought to emphasize more of a romantic celebration of the, the power of the human imagination. The power of the human imagination was really the focus of surrealism. And... Um, it, 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 I think I remember reading somewhere some scholars have said that surrealism may have been the last outstanding movement in European painting because it was a collaboration really between artists and poets of that uh, of that era. Now there's a a um, a poet and former doctor named André Breton. In 1924, he issued the first Surrealist Manifesto. The first Surrealist Manifesto in 1924. And he defined, he defined Surrealism as, quote, a psychic, 
Uh, let me see here. Okay. A psychic aut automatism by which we propose to express the real functioning of thought. A dictation of thought without any control by reason, outside all aesthetic or moral preoccupations. And so the Surrealists were emphasizing the fact that the outlandish, the exaggerated, the outrageous, the, uh, the ridiculous was beautiful. As long as it sprang from the human imagination. So it was really, in, in many ways, you, you can see it as a reassertion of the individual, of each individual's sense of self-identity in a crazy mass media world, in a crushing sense, in, due to the fact that the modern world imposes in many ways a degree of conformity and a degree of um, uniformity on people. Surrealism sought to reassert the primacy of the individual. It sought to demonstrate to the world that, hey, my imagination is important, my thoughts are important, my, my experience, my vision, my ideas, my imaginative outpourings are important. And that really was one of the big focuses, I think, of, of surrealism. And one writer said, the dream alone leaves man his rights to liberty. The dream alone leaves man his rights to liberty. So I think, I think that's a good way, or that's the way I see surrealism. That's, that's kind of the way I define it, the way I interpret it, the way I try to put it in context. So when we talk about surrealism, we're really talking about individual vision. We're really talking about each person's views of the forces that control him and that affect the world. And I think implicit in this, in this understanding is the idea that the individual's power of his imagination can in many ways reshape the world. And instead of the world imposing control over the individual, the individual can actually impose his own frame upon the world in some degree. And I think if we look at it that way, we can really see, I think, the truth uh, of, that, of that statement. And so those are some introductory thoughts. And what, I, what I'd like to do now is just to give a little bit of an overview on some of the surrealist painters that I like the most and the ones that have, um, I don't know, maybe influenced me the most. Again, this is just my own personal list. And you can make your own list. And I encourage you, and I, I hope one of the things that you'll get out of this podcast is that you will start going to museums more often. There's, there's two things you really, really need to do more often that you're not doing. One is go to museums. And number two, go outdoors, which you could see as a museum of the natural world. Because if you do these things, your senses will become more and more activated to the idea of beauty. And we have to be reminded of this because modern culture more and more now is, is seeking to crush the idea of, of beauty and even truth behind this wall of fabrications and lies. And so we have to constantly be aware of what true beauty and true truth is. And the only way you can really do that is by connecting with the greatness of man's imagination, which is found in museums and also in books, and also by the greatness of the natural world, which you encounter by actually going out and experiencing it. So that's uh, that's just a, a, a comment I'll make here. But let's let's first go let's go over these surrealist painters that I I think are important. The first is uh, uh, Giorgio de Chirico. His last name is uh, D E C H I R I C O, and he lived from 1888 to 1978. He's had a long life. And he was an Italian uh, painter, actually born in Greece. And his, he, he has a very, very compelling surrealist style, which really uh, is difficult to describe in, in, without really looking at it yourself. He basically, um, a lot of his paintings are these empty piazzas and streets and Roman monuments. 
are taken in, in city squares that are empty and deserted and there are long shadows cast. And you have these grotesque sculptural figures sort of at the center of the viewer's vision. And there's something very haunting. There's something very desolate and something at the same time very engaging about these paintings. I'm not quite sure what it is, but painting is a is an emotional experience and every every person should experience it for himself. For example, I'll look at, um, if you look at one of his compositions called The Red Tower from 1913, it's you've got a, a turret, a red, a reddish turret at the center of the canvas. And there's a shaded alleyway leading towards it. And off to the right, you have a equestrian statue there. We don't know who it is because it's, again, it's shrouded in mystery. The whole scene is just very mysterious, very ominous, not, not, not exactly threatening, but something mysterious. And I really like that quality because I think in many ways life is difficult to quantify. Life is mysterious. Life is foreboding. Life is uh, the type of thing where you never really know what's going to come at you from around the corner. And that's the sense that you get in uh, de Chirico's painting. All right, the next painter I think I'd like to call your attention to is Yves Tanguy. Uh, the name is spelled Y-V-E-S, and the last name is T-A-N-G-U-Y, I believe. T-A-N-G-U-Y, that's right. And he lived from 1900 to 1955. And he was a French, actually a Breton, from Brittany in France, a, a, a Breton surrealist painter. And I really love this guy. I really love his stuff. His his surrealist paintings uh, were influenced by the weird uh, stone structures he observed in Brittany as a child, these things by the ocean, these colossal stone monuments. And he also served for a time in the Merchant Marine, I think, if I remember right. And he became a painter in a very interesting way. I think he had no formal training. He had no formal training. I think at one point he just walked by an art gallery and he saw some paintings in the window and he said wow this is incredible I, i'd like to learn how to do this and i think he just taught himself how to how to paint and that's that's how things happen in life sometimes individuals of great talent can simply be triggered into their creativity just by some experience like that so never underestimate the power of the the motivated amateur never underestimate this guy's a world-class painter so anyway, what I like about his paintings is that they are there's something very maritime about them and they a lot of them look like paintings of the ocean floor with these weird stone shapes and objects uh, strewn about on the seafloor in a very haphazard way. But these these paintings take a lot of effort to do. I've I've actually seen many of them up close and and really got my face right up close to them just to see what they look like and these are masterful works and i don't know i i don't really know what emotions they really stir in me but i just admire the just the creativity the weirdness and the the just the surrealistic intensity of them so i i think you should you should check this out his wife was also a painter and he died he died young. He died at the age of 55, and his wife, whose name I can't immediately, uh, Sage, that was her name, Kay Sage. And he, once he died, she eventually fell into a depression. I think she eventually took her own life. Very sad, but she also has some some paintings uh, that are surrealist, and uh, she's not at his level, but they're also worth checking out. So, I again, Yves Tanguy is someone you should... And all right, the next name here is Max Ernst. Max Ernst, a German painter and sculptor, graphic artist, and he lived from 1891 to 1976. So he lived also a very long life. And he, he was a, a very, very influential surrealist painter. And I like, his, I like his work. I have a lot of respect for it. And there's, you know, there, there's something violent though about about his about his painting. When I see his, when I see his paintings, um, you know, uh, the, there's there's something not as tranquil here as uh, in terms of the feeling that the viewer gets compared with some of these other surrealist painters. L'Ange du Foyer, 
Uh, that's from 1937. It's just this this uh, horrific monster, this demon, just sort of stomping through the land. And um, some of his other paintings that I can't remember the titles of, but but uh, they 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 show a lot of technical skill, a lot of brilliance, and a lot of technical skill. And he was very influential. But there is there's something there's something about him where there's a I get the sense of a lot of repressed anger. There's a lot of repressed anger, a lot of repressed rage there. And maybe he channeled his anger as at his strict disciplinarian parents as he got older into his painting. And he was able to rebel in his own way by taking up the brush and committing to canvas the feelings of, of anger and rebellion that he was experiencing in his own life. And I think this is something that... Um, something that we should consider. So check out Max Ernst. All right, the next painter is the Spanish the Spanish painter, sculptor, and uh, ceramic artist named, um, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, it's either Juan or Juan Miro. His first name is J-O-A-N. Miro is the last name. And I don't know if that's the Catalan way of spelling Juan, or not, or if it's a different name in Spanish. So hopefully someone will correct me or guide me here because I've never. Uh, it's funny, you, you know, you you, uh, you read about these guys, you see documentaries, but you never hear anyone actually pronounce these names, or at least I never have. So I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it. Juan, Juan Miro, Juan Miro, who knows? In any case, he lived from 1893 to 1983. So again, he lived a long life. It's good. It's it's very. Very uh, reassuring to see that these guys live long lives. And his his surrealist paintings were very characterized by the sort of absurdist, these little these uh, little children's drawings almost, or pictographs with stretched limbs and smiley faces and very kind of um, almost like, like children's drawings. There's something very childlike about him and uh, perhaps he even influenced uh, Walt Disney. We don't know, but I like his stuff. I like his stuff. It's very positive. It seems very happy. And at the same time, he was able to convey some very new ideas in the in the world of art. You know, he this 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 minimalist type of uh, he. In many ways, I think he can be seen as the that intersection between surrealist art and and abstract art, surrealism and abstract art. I think you can you can try to see him. At that, uh, at that nexus. And the last artist here I'm going to talk about, of course, is the great uh, Picasso, Pablo Picasso, who needs almost no introduction. I mean, he, he um, I think we can say he was a surrealist painter, but he went through many, many different, um, he experimented with different schools of painting. And as, as often is the, the joke, he had phases, he went through phases, you know, he went through his cubist phase, he went through his uh, you know, his uh, surrealist phase. He went through this phase or that phase. But I think the one thing we can say is that he excelled in every style, in every artistic style. He was a master and he excelled in it. So uh, again, I'm not going to give a, a whole disquisition here on Picasso's painting because I think you can very easily come up with your own judgments by just going to a... Um, going to a museum or, 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 or opening a book or whatever uh, and looking at some of his paintings for yourself and, and, and judge for yourself. You know, have your own... Every person can have their own opinion about painting and, and art. Nothing wrong with that. You don't need to take anyone else's cue. You don't need to listen to what someone else thinks. If you don't agree with someone, say so. If you don't agree with someone, you, uh, someone's view of, of art, you can have your own opinion. As long as you can support it, and as long as you can describe your your um, your own thoughts, then there's nothing wrong with that. So anyway, that's that's uh, my thoughts on surrealism and surrealist painting. In 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 response to this uh, this reader on Twitter who asked me to do this, so hopefully these this list of names, this list of five people: uh, De Chirico, Yves Tanguy, Max Ernst, uh, Juan Miro, and Picasso. I hope you can check out some of the work of these guys and enjoy really enjoy get in there enjoy it have fun with it and come up with your own conclusions your own thoughts and try to find ways to incorporate that in your own life
All right, because remember, the imagination is what matters. Mischief and the imagination are two things that are greatly underestimated for success in this world. So go to it. I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night.